morning and a warm welcome to you all today and a warm welcome to, if you can't hear. Oh, this one. <laughs> Right, I'll stand a wee bit closer to it. How's that? That better? Right. I'll start again. Good morning and a warm welcome to you all. <laughs> and uh, a warm welcome to those of you who are at home, can't manage out um, and are watching it online um, this morning. We welcome Ronnie Craig and we're most grateful, Ronnie, for you coming right, this morning. I look forward to his message. Um, as you, Philip is still recovering from his uh, surgery. And we'll remember Philip in our prayers. And also remember in our prayers, Mike Trail's family and friends, as his funeral is on Monday, the 25th of March at 2.45 at Daldowie. I'll quickly run through the changes for today. Next Sunday it's half past ten as usual. Uh, Monday is the men's group and it's their AGM so it's seven o'clock for it starting at half past seven. Uh, Tuesday is the guild's AGM and it's seven o'clock for half past seven. Oh, sorry I put that down. Uh, you know, I've, I've looked at the wrong, the wrong line. Half past one starting at two. Oh, well, um, you know, they'll go through the business and there's the um, half past one. I think I'll go out and start again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, the men's group are having a group presentation dinner on Wednesday at seven o'clock at the Hairstains Golf Club. Hastings? Right, I'm definitely finished. <laughs> Walk and talk at half, uh, quarter past one, and uh, there's no prayer meeting. And thankfully, now I'll hand over to you. <laughs> I'm going home. We were just testing to make sure that everybody was on their toes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back here in St. Columbus Hillhead and uh, glad to be able to help out with uh, Philip just recovering from his, his recent surgery. And uh, so we gather today, two, two Sundays before Easter Sunday, we're very much aware just of Easter coming and Jesus laying down his life for us and remembering in those words that he, he spoke in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's worship God and sing together um, from the Mission Praise, number 41, verses 1, 3, 5, and 6, at the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus. <laughs>
Let's bow together in prayer, shall we pray? Our God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the privilege of being able to gather again freely here this Sunday morning and to worship you. And to remember who you are, the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God from whom every single blessing comes, and the God who sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die the death that we deserve to die, paying the price of our sins as he died for us on the cross. And as we approach Easter time, Father God, we are so aware of that sacrifice that you made for us and so grateful for it. For without that sacrifice, without his death for our sins, we could never come near to you. We could never know you as our loving Heavenly Father. It's all because the price has been paid. And Lord Jesus Christ, we do indeed bow before you. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Not every knee bows at, at this point in time in our world. We know that sadly. And so many do not recognize your lordship. But there is a day coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we today, Lord, we bow ourselves before you and we gladly confess Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of our lives, Lord of our hearts. Lord, come near to us today, we pray, and speak to us through your holy living word. How we thank you, Father God, for your word. You haven't left us alone in in this world without any guidance. You speak to us through your word and you have given us your Holy Spirit to help us understand your word and to help us to live our lives the way you call us to live them. So be among us today. Whatever the needs of different folk here today, whatever kind of week we've come from, maybe for some it's been easy, maybe for some it's been really hard, but oh, that we might know afresh your presence, the blessing of your presence, the ministering of your peace and grace to each one of our lives and hearts. And we ask all these things with our thankfulness to you for all your goodness in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And now Jill's going to come up and say a few words uh, about the Easter Cafe. I'm definitely not Jill. <laughs> Good morning. No. <laughs> um, nice to see you this morning. I'm usually down with the kids by this time, so it's nice to see your faces. Um, as you know, our Easter Cafe is coming up in, I think it's two weeks now. Yeah. Um, hopefully behind me, there we go, is the slide. Um, so the Easter Cafe is Saturday, the 30th of March, um, from 10 in, in the morning until 12 and it's going to be similar to the Christmas one where um, it's fun for everybody. So we'd encourage you to invite lots of people and um, invite your neighbors, invite your friends. Um, in the back of the church, there'll be these flyers that you can use to hand out as invitations or if you want to keep it for yourself and put it on your fridge. Um, what else? We will also be having a Kilimbero rice from Malawi sale as part of the half rice challenge. Um, in this building, we'll be having an Easter Reflections, um, which will be uh, used with material provided by Open Doors, which is a Christian group that supports the Suffering Church. Uh, we also am looking for volunteers. So if we can move to the next slide, which is my volunteer slide. You already did that so fast. Um, so I will be looking for a couple of volunteers to do things with the kids. So um, we'll be having a like ball pit kind of soft ish play area in the lower hall so we're looking for a couple of people who wouldn't mind to come and supervise that area just to make sure that the kids aren't going crazy and their shoes are off so nothing crazy just standing there making sure their shoes are off um, and that they're being safe um, I'm also looking for some volunteers to help me lead some kids games which is going to be super non-intensive just kind of managing the children just to say like this is what you do and that's what you don't do um, 
I'm also looking for people who would be interested in face painting. Um, and that would be super easy. I'd give you a picture. It'd be something really simple and small, just like on their cheek or on their hand. Um, and so for the kids' games and the face painting, it will need to be somebody who's PVG'd. Uh, so if anybody is PVG'd and wouldn't mind helping, I'd really appreciate that. And the last thing I'll be looking for volunteers for is our Easter reflection. So it would be honestly to the benefit of everybody who will be using the reflection stations. If there could be one or two people here in the church who'd be willing to help um, show people how to go along the reflections. And um, if anybody has any questions about like the Easter story, it'd be nice to have somebody from the church who can kind of tell them about Jesus if they're curious. Um, so that way they're not in here all by themselves. Um, so I have made up this cute little sign-up sheet, and there's one on the back table back there, and there will also be them on the tables for coffee and tea time. So if you are interested, I would encourage you just to fill it out with your name, um, which role you think you might be interested in doing, and an email address if you have one, and then I could email you um, sort of instructions about what would be happening. Um, and if you have any questions about the roles, I'll be around after church, or you can catch me during the week, um, or you can email me. So I hope you sign up, and thank you so much. Thank you, Cassie. Sorry for that misunderstanding. I got a text last night saying it was going to be chill, but obviously things have changed again. You're speaking. Anyway, thank you for that. You still use a diary, by the way, um, a, a, one, a diary like that. So many folk now are using their phones for putting down all their engagements, all the things they've got on, but I still like, I still like having a paper diary. And uh, I wonder when you uh, look at your diary, what you've got on for the coming week, what you think about all you've got on. Maybe there's things that you're looking forward to. Uh, we are looking after grandchildren for part of this week. And we're looking forward to, to that. I've got a diabetic clinic appointment tomorrow, and I'm not particularly looking forward to that because I've probably been, um, been taking too much sugar recently. Uh, that kind of thing. There's all sorts of different things. We could have engagements, people to see, people to phone meals out or whatever, school to go to for the young ones, and uh, maybe you look forward to that, maybe you don't. Um, but uh, as I say, all sorts of things that are... Are, 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 that we can be looking forward to, some that we're not looking forward to, but some of the things that we maybe don't look forward to, we still have to go through with, don't we? And I was just thinking about Jesus on his final trip to Jerusalem before he died on the cross. And he knew what he was, that that lay ahead of him. He knew what was going to face him. He knew he was going to be arrested. He knew he was going to be tortured, spat upon, beaten, he knew he was going to die, and he knew he was going to be raised from the dead. And he told his disciples this. He told them that he was going to, to, to die in Jerusalem and suffer in Jerusalem. And as, he made, as they made their way on that final journey, he told them for a third time, three times he, he, he's recorded as having speaking about this. And he couldn't have been looking forward to it, anything but. We know from the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed that this cup might be taken from him, but not as I will, but as you, your will be done. And he was determined, even as he, he made his way to Jerusalem, no, he knew that he had to go through with this because this is what God had called him to do. It was the only way that we people could be put right with God. It was for him to lay down his life for our sins. And it's amazing that that determination to go through with something that you don't want to go through with, that he didn't want to go through with, but he did because he knew that that was what God had called him to. It's amazing, doesn't it? It gives a, another perspective maybe for our lives and things maybe we think, well, I don't want to go through with this. Some of those things we, we know, but we have to. There are just things that we have to go through with, and we do so, uh, trusting in God. We're going to sing together. It's a lovely song. I don't know if you know it well of when you last sang it, but Jean's going to kindly play it through for us. It's called The Greatest Thing in All My Life is Knowing You. And I hope that's just what we feel, the greatest thing in our lives is knowing God, knowing the Lord Jesus, and loving him and serving him. We're going to sing that together. Thank you, Jean.
Is this the point the young ones go in? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's enthusiasm. to get out or running with excitement to get to their lesson. <laughs> We're going to read from the Word of God this morning from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. We're going to read verses 32 to 45. And here we have Jesus um, along with his disciples on the final journey that Jesus was to make to Jerusalem. And his prediction of his death for a third time, as we read. Chapter 10 of Mark's Gospel, verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished. While those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. And be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. We thank God for his word. And may he grant us that help of his spirit as we come shortly to consider that message today. We're going to sing together, mission page 465, words on the screen, meekness and majesty, which is just really what we've been reading about, isn't it? Meekness and majesty.
Let's join together in our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let's pray. <coughs> our God, we've got so much to thank you for. And forgive us that so often we are blind to your daily gifts to us, all the blessings that come from you, life and health and strength and family. And Lord, the blessing of our faith that you have given to us that enables us to draw near to you and in trust, that enables us to sense your presence and experience your blessings and thankfulness for giving us Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this time of springtime with Easter set in springtime and the way that springtime itself points to the truth of death and resurrection. With the death of so much of nature in winter, the plants, the tree, the, the flowers, and the, the leaves and the trees falling off in winter time, and then all the new buds in springtime, and so many signs of life around us, and the joy that brings, even as we see the crocuses and the daffodils, Lord God, and in the nature itself proclaiming resurrection. And oh, how we thank as we gather today. We know. As we come to Easter time, we think so much of the sacrifice made and Jesus' death on the cross, and rightly so. But Lord, it's wonderful to think of that in the light of the resurrection and to know that death could not hold him, that he is risen. And even as we worship today, the Lord Jesus is here. How we thank you. Our Father God, we pray, we, we pray, continue to pray for the trouble spots of our world, and again, thinking so much of Ukraine and Gaza, with the continuing conflicts there, and the huge loss of life, thousands upon thousands of people who have been killed in, in Ukraine, in Russia, in Gaza, in these conflicts. Father God, and praying for your mercy, praying for an end to those conflicts, praying for comfort for the bereaved, Father God, praying for help for in Gaza, for those who are involved in medical care, with uh, that being put at risk with, with, with the, the various attacks that there have been and the bombings, O oh Lord our God, and the pictures that we see in television, we, we can't even begin to imagine the horrors of it all. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for all those who seek to bring about peace in those conflicts. Lord, we pray, for, we, pr we pray, indeed, that peace will come and come soon. And we pray for Christians in th those areas of conflict as they seek to minister your love and care and compassion to those around them and bringing practical help. Christians in Ukraine, Christians in Russia, Christians in Gaza, Christians in Israel, we pray for them, Lord, that they may shine your light and speak your word of truth with grace and kindness, Lord that in the midst of the horrors of war, people might hear of you, of Jesus, and your love and your eternal purposes, Lord. Hear our prayers. Father God, as we approach Easter, we pray that you will help us in our own times of daily reflection on all that you went through, Lord Jesus, for us, as you made your way to Jer Jerusalem and laid down your life for us. We think of all the Easter activities planned, Holy Week services here in St. Columbus Hill Head and in St. Mary's and St. David's on the Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of Holy Week and then Easter Day with the, with the, the wonderful good news of Jesus is risen to celebrate. Father God, bless, we pray, all these ventures and the Easter cafe we were hearing about today, that that will be a real means of blessing to all who come along, and it will be folk from the area who will come along, Father God. We think of the Easter Holiday Club and Hillhead Church, the, the Restoration Station, a joint venture with St. Columbus Hillhead and in partnership with KBC, and we, we pray for Cassie and her involvement in that and others in the team and pray that that will be, be a real time of blessing for the young folk who come along. And so too the contacts with parents and carers and other and grandparents that Lord that this will be a real time of of, of, of blessing as um, the Easter message is, is is made known. 
and your love in Jesus is shared here as Father. Here is in our prayers for this congregation, dear God, for office bearers and members, for your blessing, for, for Philip, Lord, after his recent hernia repair up, and just praying for, for a quick com and complete healing for him, for you to be with him and Jill and, the, and their sons, we pray, for the family, bless them, we pray. Lord, for, for those who've been bereaved recently or in the past, we pray for your comfort. We think of the recent death of Mike Trail, who for so many years has been an active member and elder in this church in St. Columbus and also since the Union St. Columbus Hill Head involved. We, we thank you for his life and faith and witness, Lord, and service and pray for Chris and the family at this time that you'll be with them in all these days of readjustment and for the funeral a week, and, a week tomorrow at Dildawi, oh God, be there. And may the hope of the gospel, the sure and certain hope of resurrection life for all who trust in you, be their comfort and strength. And Lord, for all here today who are going through difficulties of one kind or another, <clears throat> you see into our hearts, you know our needs. And we thank you that as you look into our hearts and see our needs, you do so with loving compassion. And so, Lord, we pray for your, your blessing, your healing touch, your encouragement, your reassurance for each one of us here today. And, Lord, for strength to be true to you in our daily living. So many people in our society, Lord, have lost sight of you. So many people never give you a thought. So many people will go through Easter without ever even thinking what Easter signifies. Oh, Lord, our God, that we, your church, might reflect your life and speak your truth with grace, we pray, and be a real influence on those around us. Hear us, Father God, and these are prayers spoken, and also in our unspoken prayers that we bring to you in the silence. Our Father God, we thank you that you hear our prayers and answer them in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing number 806 from the Mission Praise, the words on the screen, Beauty for Brokenness. <coughs>
that song is a prayer, isn't it? And it's a prayer, surely, that we need continually to pray in the midst of our troubled world with all its, with all its suffering and all its just incredible need. We are, we are so privileged to live in a country where we can gather and worship freely and where we know where our next meal is coming from and all the comforts that we have. But there's thousands, there's millions of people who don't have that. And that song reminds us of that. Can you all, is, is this all right? Is this loud enough? Can you hear me all right? That's a bit of a silly question. I always think if you can't hear me, you won't know what I'm saying. But anyway, there we are. You, you can hear. Well, this morning, um, the title of the sermon this morning is Self-Seeking or self-sacrifice, as we look at the passage we read earlier from Mark chapter 10. Self-seeking or self-sacrifice. In the Whitney Houston song, not that I'm a great follower of all the songs and the charts and all those kind of things, a lot of years since Whitney Houston sang this song, but she sang a song, Greatest Love of All. And in that song, there is the line, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Contrast that view expressed in those words with words that were spoken by C.T. Studd. You may remember, you may have heard of him before, a former great cricketer, lived at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century. He later became a well-known Christian missionary who served, among other places, in the Belgian Congo, as it was known then, present-day Democratic Republic of the Congo. And C.T. Studd, one of the most famous uh, quotes of C.T. Studd is this, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. What a huge contrast between that statement of Whitney Houston and that statement of C.T. Studd. A contrast between these two polar opposites of statements of self-seeking and self-sacrifice. I wonder where you would place yourself if you were asked to consider your approach to life on a self-seeking or self-sacrifice scale. And where others have asked would place you or me on that scale, because we can be so blind, can't we? We can think, and if we were to, to know from others what, what, what they thought of where we were in that self-seeking, self-sacrifice scale. One thing for certain is that our Lord Jesus Christ would have been right at the self-sacrifice end of the scale, with not a trace of self-seeking to be found in him. And yet the secular world around us in so many ways entices us, doesn't it, to put ourselves first. And to some degree, sadly, we're all tainted by self-seeking motives in the living of our lives. Well, in the passage we read earlier from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 to 45, we see such a contrast, contrast between Jesus' spirit of self-sacrifice and the self-seeking spirit so evident in the disciples James and John. Firstly, though, we see in the passage Jesus heading for the cross. Thank you. Jesus heading for the cross. Jesus was on his final journey to Jerusalem on the journey which Jesus knew would lead to his death on the cross. In no way was Jesus' death an unforeseen tragedy. Rather, it was the climax of his ministry on this earth. It was the very thing he had come down to this earth to do, to pay the penalty of human sin by the willing sacrifice of his life on the cross for us all. And there was a striking resolution and purposefulness in the way that Jesus led his disciples forward toward Jerusalem. And the disciples and all the other people who were following as they made their way to Jerusalem, it was the time of, of the Passover festival, so there, were, there would have been crowds there. They had a sense of foreboding about what lay ahead in Jerusalem. Think of that, that verse 32 we read. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished. Well, those who followed were afraid. There was a sense that something incredibly important was happening. 
And we read again, Jesus took his disciples aside and for the third time in Mark's gospel, told them what was going to happen to him, this time including specific references to how he would be mocked and spat upon, flogged before being killed and then rising. Verses 33, 32 to 34, again, he took the 12 aside. He told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. At that point, the disciples still just couldn't take in the fact that these things were going to happen to Jesus. Later, of course, after Jesus' death and his resurrection, they would remember those repeated predictions and be aware that his death had been no accident, but had been intended by him all along. And as we consider the resoluteness of Jesus to carry out and to complete God's will for his life, there is surely, is there not, there's surely a challenge here for every one of us to be as resolute in our own lives in being true to God and as disciples of Jesus Christ, following faithful in his way right to the end, come what may. Are you resolved to follow Jesus Christ like that right to the end of your life? Am I? I ask myself the same question. I hope so, and I pray so. So we have Jesus heading for the cross in these verses we read, but secondly, we have James's, uh, James and John's self-centered ambition. It's really quite, in <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Excuse me. It's really quite incredible, isn't it, that right after hearing Jesus speaking about his coming suffering, persecution, and death, we read of James and John coming to Jesus with a re request that was so out of place at any time, and especially so in the light of what Jesus had just been saying. Mind you, we can probably all, each one of us, think of times when we too have said totally inappropriate things and being in completely insensitive to what other people have been going through, can't we? I can think of that. Well, James and John came to Jesus. He'd been speaking about what was going to happen to him, his suffering and death, resurrection. Jesus, Jesus, uh, James and John came to Jesus and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. As someone has said, that requ request must surely qualify in the Guinness Book of Records for being one of the worst prayers ever prayed. One of the worst prayers ever prayed. Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Talk about self-centered praying. About presumptuously expecting the Lord to be at our beck and call there to fulfill our desires, whatever they may be. And we, we know that James and John's request was totally self-centered. For when Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They replied at verse 3, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. <clears throat> in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew's account of the incident, we're told that the mother of James and John was also there with her sons, asking Jesus for the same thing for them. She was as overly ambitious for her sons as they were for themselves. Maybe James and John in making their request had been thinking about something Jesus had been saying to his disciples quite recently when he'd said, recorded in Matthew 19, 28, I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And maybe James and John, remembering that, egged on by their equally ambitious mother, had thought of that coming day of glory and wanted, how can I put it, wanted to reserve the best seats for themselves, uh, those at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. Whatever, the request was clearly one that arose from their self-centered, their self-seeking ambition. It makes you wonder how much had they actually taken in of Jesus' teaching 
about the necessity of humble and, and, and selfless service in the lives of those who followed him. Had they forgotten those words spoken by Jesus recorded just in the previous chapter, chapter 8, verse 34 of Mark. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Friends, it's so easy for all of us, isn't it, to pay lip service to the demands that Jesus makes of us, to say, yes, I, I want to follow Jesus. And, and I know that that means denying myself and taking up the cross to follow him. And yet all the time, carrying on living our lives for our own interests and our own pleasures. We have to be so careful not to harshly judge James and John for the kind of inconsistency that can be all too apparent in our own lives. After James and John had asked Jesus, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory, Jesus said to them, you, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am, I am baptized with? And in here talking of the cup and of, and of baptism, Jesus was speaking of his suffering. But the disciples, not understanding this, answered Jesus, we can. We can. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And indeed, James and John were to later drink that cup of suffering in that James would later in his life, later on, be, he would be executed by King Herod, the, uh, King Herod Antipas for being a disciple of Jesus. And John, when he was an old man, would be exiled on the small island of Patmos on account of his faith in Jesus. Yes, suffering did lie ahead of them. It's interesting to read then at verse 41 how when the other ten disciples heard about James and John's request to Jesus, they were furious with them. Furious, you can't help but feel, because they themselves wanted the best places of honor when Jesus returned in his glory. Indeed, in the previous chapter at verses 33 and 34, we find the disciples had been arguing about, about, among themselves about which one of them was the greatest. The disciples of Jesus jockeying for power, for authority, for preeminence over one another, to be able to tell others what to do. And this, you see, of course, friends, is exactly what characterizes the spirit of the unbelieving world, where so often what counts is, is power and prestige, is wealth and influence, ambition, fame, pleasure, comfort. And all of us can so easily get drawn aside into seeking these things for ourselves. And yes, even professing Christians being lured by the things that the unbelieving world counts as all important and being compromised in our faith as we follow after these self-seeking goals. In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus called his disciples together, knowing they'd been squabbling about this, and called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. These words should be utter, uh, underlined as of complete importance. Frequently, we hear of people, don't we, in positions of power, and authority. Just think of President Putin and the way he's been acting. But there's so many like misusing that power and authority for their own ends, pompously bossing around those who are below them. The old saying, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Maybe some of us have experienced this in our working lives when someone who's been promoted over us becomes a bossy tyrant. Not so with you, says Jesus to his disciples. Not so with you, says Jesus to you and me here today. Being a Christian disciple means living by a different spirit from the unbelieving world. 
Being a Christian disciple means having a completely different set of values from the unbelieving world. Being a Christian disciple means having very different kinds of ambitions from the ambitions of the unbelieving world. So we have in our passage Jesus heading for the cross. We see with sadness that James and John's self-centered ambition. But thirdly and finally in our passage, we see how true greatness is marked by humble, selfless service. Jesus says at verses 43 to 45, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. <clears throat> and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think of Jesus leaving the glory of his heavenly Father's side in heaven to come down to this sin-spoiled world. Jesus coming down to this earth to speak God's truth to us. Jesus coming down to this earth to show us what God is like in human form. Jesus coming down to this earth to put us right with God by removing the barrier of our sinfulness that cuts us off from God. Removing that barrier by taking the punishment for our sins upon himself as he died for us on the cross. Humbly bearing the scorn, the spitting, the flogging of the persecutors, the agony of the cross for you and for me. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is greatness. This is true greatness. The unbelieving world may not recognize it. But I hope that by the grace of God, all of our eyes have been opened to see that humble, selfless service of others is what constitutes great, true greatness. We may so often fail to live up to this God-revealed, God-given standard, but by God's grace, if we've opened our hearts in true repentance and faith to Jesus Christ, we press on, we must press on in this path that we're called to of humble and selfless service. And we need to pray continually for the help of God's Holy Spirit, who alone can enable us, because we can't do it ourselves. Who, the Holy Spirit who alone can enable us to turn from self-seeking ambition to self-sacrificial service of others. It's not easy. And at times like James and John and the other disciples, our tendency to self-centered ambition will seek to reassert itself. And those words of Jesus will come back to challenge us again and again. Not so with you. Whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. And inevitably, too, there will be times when we will share in Jesus' cup of suffering, when we may be scorned, we may be ill-treated, sidelined, all because of our Christian living, scorned by some of the self-focused, ambitious go-getters around us. So as we close back to the original question, are our lives, is your life, is my life, more characterized by self-seeking or self-sacrifice. Following Jesus as Savior and Lord calls for us to embrace a spirit of self-sacrifice and humble service. Let me close by quoting the verses of an old hymn um, written by the 19th century hymn writer Theodore Mono. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow. I don't know if any of you remember it, but listen to these words, and particularly the last line of each verse that progresses, as you'll see. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Saviour's pity plead in vain and proudly answered all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me. I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree, heard him pray, forgive them, Father. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong and oh so patient, brought me lower while I whispered less of self and more of thee. 
higher than the deepest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love at last is conquered. Grant me now my supplication, none of self and all of thee. Where are you in that journey of faith in God and in Jesus Christ? Where am I? Is your life, is my life all of self and none of him? Or some of self and some of him? Or less of self and more of him? Or none of self and all of him? May God give us humble servant hearts that reflect his nature and his love in Jesus Christ to those around us. May God add his blessing to this meditation and his word this morning. We're going to close by singing together the servant king from heaven. You came, helpless babe, that captures so much of what we've been saying this morning. 162, mission please. <coughs> Lord our God, we thank you <clears throat> for the example that your son Jesus sets to us. He who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Help us, O oh Lord our God, to follow in your way and to seek to serve others and to put others' interests before our own. Grant us that help of your Holy Spirit to enable us to do so. And may your blessing, Lord, 
your blessing from Almighty God, from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of us and all our loved ones, this day, now, and always. Amen.